Hello and welcome back to our series on Colossians, Christ in You, the Hope of Glory. And we are in lesson five tonight. So this will be our halfway point in the series. We're in the middle of chapter two, but let's review our passages from last week. So this was two, these two parallel paragraphs that are Paul's discussion of his own ministry and where it fits into God's ministry, um, how, how, what his role is, and then how it affects the believers in Colossae. So if you, uh, only a couple of people were he, that are here now were here last week, but I want to give you a chance to, to make any comments. What did you, what st stood out to you or what did you find meaningful out of that passage? I like verse 21. No, yeah. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. Yeah, okay. So um that is that is a great passage that idea of um being enemies and being redeemed into uh that relationship um out of you know the the broken relationship and into a whole relationship. Yeah. Uh I think the whole idea of it like it's very Christ centered. You know, that like through him and um, in him and through him and everything was created and just the the really um, focus on Christ, um, yeah. kind of how he changed everything. Yes, and it was so interesting, wasn't it, to see. So we, we did the, the passage of the Christ hymn, right? And then Paul begins to talk about himself. But in talking about himself, he goes back and it mm -hmm. all ends up being about Christ again. And so he ends up sort of dwelling on and repeating mm -hmm. the mystery. Um, Paul is discussing his ministry, but then it's like, what my ministry is, is all about the mystery. And he, he, what is the mystery is, you know, when we come to this passage, I think that's the first thing that really catches us. Like, what is this mystery he keeps talking about? And the idea of the mystery really is just equated to Jesus and the gospel story. And I think the reason he talks about it as a mystery is sort of capturing how the gospel story is so strange and wonderful. It's such a, an unexpected uh, thing for God himself to come down and dwell with us and yeah. himself to, um, to be our uh, salvation. And so that dwelling in the mystery sort of happens in both of those, those two paragraphs where Paul is talking about his ministry he ends up back coming back around and it's all about Jesus and his goal in in each of those times he sort of gets to his goal for the Colossians which is maturity in Christ the other sort of uh, interesting thing out of last week's lesson was we talked about the confusing phrase I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And we talked about, well, what doesn't this mean? Um, I, what is lacking with regard to Christ's afflictions? Is he, could he be saying that there's something insufficient about Jesus and his work on the cross? And we said, no, he just said the opposite. So we know, you know, he he is he just said that Christ is supreme in creation, supreme in salvation. And so what this doesn't mean is that Jesus and his saving work in his death, burial, and resurrection are lacking anything. But what does it mean? And we talked about how um 
the, the there's always a clash um and this is a metaphor that came to me during this week um when you get uh we you listening to the weather um the weather report um you will often hear like oh this bit of cold air is coming this way and this bit of hot air is coming this way and so in it we get that clash we get storms we get weather out of that when the cold air and the hot air are meeting each other and i think there's a a, a, a parallel in sort of the spiritual nature of things where when the regular life of the present evil age meets the inbreaking of God's kind of life, of the resurrected life, of the life of Jesus living in us and that mystery and how that comes into our lives and changes us. And when those two meet, there's always some tribulations, there's some storm, there's some roiling upset that will happen when those meet each other. And so Paul talks about like the the life of, of taking the life of Jesus out into the current age will contain afflictions, will lead to struggle, it will lead to suffering. And that's why he refers to his, his struggle, his striving, his suffering. And that's the path that Jesus walked. And that's the path that we walk in imitation of Jesus. And so I think that's what he's talking about is that the path before us is what is lacking or what is left to be done um, going forward to share the story of Jesus. Questions or comments on last week's lesson? We have to remember also he was in prison when he was writing all this. Yeah, yeah. And there's a little, uh, so Paul is definitely like physically suffering himself. And there's a little piece in today's lesson that I think ties into Paul being in prison too. So that's a good reminder. We'll, we'll, we'll hit that again. All right, well, let's read um, Colossians 2, 6 through 15, if someone would read that aloud. I can do that. Thank you. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Does it really say that twice? Oh, I just read it twice. I was like, no way did it say that twice. <laughs> Sorry. But it's in there. <laughs> it is. And I meant it. <laughs> for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power working of god powerful working of god who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Okay, thank you. Is that all one sentence? <laughs> Paul does that, doesn't he? Oh, I'm just looking at Daniel Hawthorne. It depends on the translation whether they break it up, but very often, you know, the original is just, you know, 15 verses of run on sentence. Very, very often. So, okay, so this is a kind of there's there's several pieces in this, and verses six and seven is where we started, and these are kind of a header for everything he's going to say um, underneath, right? And we're used to like an argument that leads up to a summary statement, you know, that would maybe be at the end. This is more like um, a, a, a summary statement that comes at the beginning, um, six and seven. So we'll, we'll talk about those first. Um, 
and then we'll go into some of these kind of like how 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 do the how does that work and then there's a whole ser- section on circumcision and baptism so we'll be we'll move through all of those okay so six and seven the first words of six okay before we get down de- deep into that what's the first word or words of of verse six so then so then i heard what else therefore therefore okay so we we have this as an indicator that Paul is now going to build on what he's already said, right? Um, and that's the, you know, all the theologians like to make the same joke. Um, whenever we see a therefore, we have to ask what it's there for. Um, so y'all can join um, in that. <laughs> it's old, but it's useful. Um, so this idea is that that he's building on that the mystery is christ himself and that christ is in you okay that's our foundation now what's the first part of the of the message of this verse you already what You're already received, oh, good. received Christ Jesus as Lord. Yeah. So they are, you know, he, he, he never fails to remind them that they already heard the true gospel and that they, you know, they should stick to that one. Don't go off on a new gospel. Right. So he, he always takes this, um, every opportunity to say you already received Jesus. Um, and it, Part of that is, you know, he's he's saying you have this great mystery and look at the good news you have received. You have received Jesus. And so what is your first instruction? As you receive Jesus as Lord, do what? And you continue to live in him, rooted and built in him. Okay, so we have these two, these several parts, right? Continue to, yours has live in him. Does anyone have anything different? This is more literally walk in him. And this walking metaphor has already shown up once in Colossians. In Colossians 1.10, Paul says that you will, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Well, some of our translators have um, given us, you know, the the meaning rather than the metaphor. Um, But walking is, uh, is a little more evocative, right? It tells us something about what it's like to live in Jesus. When you're walking in something it if you walk for a long time what does it require endurance yeah stamina endurance strength a long walk a walk for a lifetime is work and so that's that is i think part of this metaphor here what else You know, if we're going to walk in a Christian life, we walk with a direction and a destination. And so for that, if this is the metaphor of what it's like to live a life in Jesus, then it tells us that it requires us to have a direction um, created by, defined by, who Jesus is and a destination for that. And then the the last part that I thought of, and you y'all may think of more, but the idea of uh, when you are walking, if you if if your life is a walk, then it requires avoiding pitfalls, avoiding obstacles. And so 
Paul is living that, right? And he is living in kind of an obstacle and navigating that in his imprisonment. But that's that idea of like a walk requires all of those things. Okay, so if we're going to walk in him, how is it that we do that? And so Paul he's got this walking metaphor and then he's going to layer it up with other metaphors. He really mixes them. You know, if you're writing an essay, maybe this is frowned upon, but Paul layers up his metaphors to good effect um, here. So the first one, he says, someone already said it rooted. What kind of, what kind of metaphor is this? What do we mean? What's if you're rooted, what does that mean? Fortified. Fortified? Okay. Standing firm. Of uh, And some of your translations will say firmly rooted. Yeah. What, what category of metaphor is it? If you have roots, what are you? A tree or a plant or something growing. Yeah, some some growing. It's an agricultural metaphor of some kind, a tree, a plant. And so, you know, this echoes um, passages that we already know, like the opening of Psalms is um, the wise man will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Or Jesus instructions to his disciples at the end of John, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches and he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. So that's that idea of being rooted in Jesus is an idea that we're like a plant with a good root system. What is a good root system provide a plant? Nutrients. Yeah. yeah, nourishment, nutrients. What else? Stability. Yeah, stability. So there's this idea of like Jesus is the source of life and he keeps us vibrant, healthy, stable. Um, and then so then so he's so rooted. And then the next piece is um, built up and established or some some will say um, strengthened, but He's so rooted was uh, past tense. You're already rooted. And now the um, the ongoing is he uses an ongoing verb tense of something you can continue to be, which is built up and established. And it may I don't know that our translations really um convey this all the way but this is an architectural metaphor he's talking about buildings right so if you're talking about buildings what does it mean to be built up and established in jesus that settled say that one more time set or settled Okay, so the idea of stability, again, I think, um, yeah, the, 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 the good foundation. Yeah, what else? If you're ongoing in this, then you have that uh, idea of growth. Right. And so he's he's done these two metaphors together that both imply, you know, a good foundation, roots, building, but also viable growth so that you would continue to grow in him. And I think that's why Paul uses both is that they have those elements in common. And he says, as you were taught. Right. Again, it's the idea of you need to stay on target. You need to stay with the gospel you have already known and not, you know, be distracted off into any into these new and appealing ideas. And then he wraps it up with what in verse seven? You're overflowing with what? Thankfulness. Yeah, thankfulness or gratitude. Um, once it, So this is another one of those words that shows up four times in Colossians as part of the foundation of the Christian. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I think it is four. I didn't write down how many times I just said multiple, but I think it's four. Um, gratitude. 
a life of thankfulness is part of the foundation and the growth of walking in Jesus. So this whole passage is kind of communicating that because of the strange and wonderful truth of Jesus in you, the mystery, your way forward is to walk the walk and to grow into what you are. You've already been made this person of Jesus with this new life, but we we become in action what we have already been said to be, been made to be in Jesus. So that's kind of the header for everything that's coming next. Questions or comments on that? Rooted, strengthened, overflowing. Interesting differences there, just sort of, you know, past tense and then sort of uh, overflowing to, to continue on to the next. Yeah, ongoing. Right. Not yeah. that he your cup was in... filled. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, so it's, that's, that's kind of, that's, you know, that's what struck me about, like, you've already become it, but now you get to walk um, forward in it so that it's both already and becoming. Yeah. Well, in verse eight, Paul moves into his first specific warning. What's his first specific warning? Hollow and deceptive philosophy. Okay. It's against hollow and but what, what does he say? Don't be, uh, I'm interested. Captive. What's yours? Don't make sure no one takes you captive. Takes you captive, right? So this is interesting for Paul because he is captive, right? He is in prison. <laughs> um, he, is, he is living physically as a captive and yet spiritually he says don't take don't let anyone take you captive right and he's already used that metaphor of rescue from captivity you were rescued from the domain of darkness so then you've already been rescued don't do anything by choice or by inattention that would allow yourself to be taken captive again and um this is what you know and the what would take you captive? This is what um, Kristen pointed out, uh, hollow and deceptive philosophy, um, philosophy or empty deception. So this word philosophy, this is the only time it's used in the New Testament. But in this period, the word philosophy would often be used for things that we would call a religion. Um, because a philosophy is a set of ideas to live by. Now, we sometimes use philosophy that way, and sometimes we use it much more lightly, right? Like you might have your own philosophy for what wordle word you start with, and that isn't something that is, you know, encapsulates your whole life um, principles. But if you have a life philosophy, that would be more similar to the way that they would use that word. But he says these philosophies are hollow and deceptive. What makes a philosophy hollow? This is this word is literally empty. What would make something an empty philosophy? I would say something that like has no depth like it's just very like surface level. There's nothing deeper. Yeah. And, and, and that's how we could maybe be drawn to something where the surface level looks good and then underneath it's hollow. Yeah. Yeah. What else? unsubstantiated okay unsubstantiated this idea of like if it if it doesn't have reality the the truest of the truth at the center then it it 
you you just punch through it into empty air there's nothing in there and so i think this is you know paul would say if jesus is not at the center if the the content of god in the flesh is not at the center of this philosophy then whatever it is it's empty it can't we can't get to the truth if the truth in person, Jesus, is not at the center of this philosophy. And so he calls it hollow. He calls it deceptive, right? This, I think this is, again, parallel to that domain of darkness idea. When you don't um, have Jesus as the focus, you can't see um, truth and goodness the way that Jesus shows it to us. Um, and he talks about these being of the traditions of men. What do you make of that? It makes me think of Fiddler on the Roof. I don't really know Fiddler on the Roof in detail. Tell me more. There's a whole song about traditions and how they have to live by their traditions. Uh huh. No matter what their traditions were, that's what they live by. Um, <clears throat> you can only do things in this order. You have Mary in this order. You have your role and your position and your thing. And that's a human, that's their tradition. And I mean, we have our traditions and there are things, you know, I mean, Okay, this is a little more controversial, but like in our religious traditions, it's always been, you know, the role of women in the church is a, you know, it's kind of a tradition. And there are things we have Christmas traditions that doesn't mean they, they or really. anti Christmas traditions. Hmm? Or anti Christmas traditions. Yeah, you know, known just, some of those. Are your traditions more important to you than? than God. I think of your Daniel study when you talk about all the traditions and all the things that they let fall away. Mm. Because yeah, they, they took less the traditions and they and weren't the, part. Yeah. Yeah. Taking on the dress and the literature and the language of their captors had to have been so painful for our young men in Daniel. And yet that wasn't what was at the heart of it. And so they let all those things go and just stuck to what they thought was at the heart um, of following God. Yeah, I think this is a tricky one. Um, I think uh, Paul may be talking about Jewish traditions here. You know, and we sort of, you know, maybe the fiddler on the roof is a parallel there directly, but he may just have been talking about everything that we do. If it's not, if we're not willing to subject it to uh, the test of if Jesus is at the center, if it um, it helps us be rooted and built up, then then maybe we need to question it as a tradition. So it, you know, tra our traditions are good. Paul uses the word tradition positively in other places where he talks about handing down the tradition of the gospel. The truth of the gospel um and then you know negatively here and so it can be both there's some there's some nuance there that we really have to um think hard about when we're trying to figure out what whether something is a hollow and deceptive philosophy or whether we were, we're just trying to do um the right thing according to god it's it's difficult i think it's made more difficult because there's always enemies against doing the right thing. And he, Paul goes into that next. He says, according to the traditions of men, and then what? According to what? Or depending on what? In verse 8. What are those elementary principles? What are those elementary principles? What, someone else spoke. Who was it? It just says basic principles. It's my basic version. principles. What elemental other spiritual forces of this elemental world. spiritual forces? Okay, these are broad. This is these are broadly different, aren't they? These are substantially different translations. Um, our translators are really trying to help us out because this is a mysterious phrase. 
Um, the in Greek it is one word. <laughs> the elemental spiritual forces or um, basic principles, elementary principles is just the word stoichion. This is a word that we have in English, but it has a technical meaning in chemistry. And so, you know, we don't really, we don't really have a, a parallel grasp of what the stoichion are, but it means the basic parts. So it would be like saying the ABCs um, or the elements. Now, um, elements for them are not like we would like, it's not like the periodic table, right? That comes later. This would have meant, elements would have meant to them, earth, air, fire, water, right? The elements of creation um, is how they would have talked about that. But the stoichion just means like the basic parts, the ABCs. So he says, according to the tradition of men or the stoichion of this world, the basic parts, the elements of this world, rather than on Christ. And I think our translators, while I don't always like it when they put it in the translation, what they think it means, I think they it's a it's a good um, I think it's a good likelihood of what it does mean. So this could mean earth, air, wire, fire, earth, air, fire, water personified and viewed as the ruling spirits in the Greek world. It could mean another um, set of elemental spirits um, believed to control the world. Um, it could mean elementary principles that they believed were sources of wisdom or knowledge in, the, in some competing philosophy that we don't know exactly what it is. But in some way, he's talking about the stoichion, and he, he uses it again, um, in 220 so we will that'll be next week um uh, it calls it basic see and ivy drives me crazy because it does this um in oh basic it calls it basic principles at both times in an ivy i have a question um go ahead Anna, do you think this was um like a needed cultural reference because the greeks worshiped gods of you know the sea and you know agriculture and you know the god of such and such um do you think this was speaking to them to not worship these greek gods but focus more on christ or do you think it's for us today thinking about things like ouija boards and you know psychics and you know the worship of money or love of money um you know, uh, or all of the above. I mean, how do you read that? Because I've gone to a, a conservative, I went to a conservative Christian Church of Christ in DC for a little while. And they were against Halloween. They were against yoga because they saw it as the worship of the sun. They were against all kinds of things. So I'm wondering if this is like a, this is more of a, to the Greeks who were polytheistic. Yeah. So I think this is this is exactly the question here, um, and I think and this is why I, I'm like breaking this down and telling you that this is just this word stoichion that it is um, a little bit open to interpretation, and why I want you to know that maybe the elemental spirits of this world, like that, that's a little bit of um, the interpreters have the translators have put in an interpretation when they include the word spirits in there because it's not in the text. I, I think that, um, so it seems that Paul has left it a little bit open, right? It doesn't appear that he's talking directly about Greek deities such as like Zeus, etc. Um, uh, or Roman by this point, um, right, you know, yeah. Greek slash Roman, um, because he doesn't say that exactly. He says something more general. And I think the idea is to refer to, um, maybe back, like if we look back at the Christ hymn, 
Um, he says that Jesus is firstborn over all creation, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. And so whatever philosophy you have come out of or are meeting, where there are these powers, whatever the powers that you are understanding that run the universe and maybe we sometimes we act like science is personified into a power right um so whatever the powers that you think run the universe jesus they were created through jesus and are subject to jesus and he is supreme over them and so i think what is is meant here is something like the elemental spirits whatever you think they are the powers and rulers of authority and authorities but the fact that um paul leaves it less specified just whatever the basic parts are i i think is meant to speak to us that somehow we will meet many philosophies that are opposed to Jesus, and yet no, no parts of them are not subject to Jesus. So I, I think that's kind of the his point here, you know, because he moves into nine and 10. Why don't you need these hollow and deceptive philosophies? Why don't you need these elemental principles? Because in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. It's this idea where they are empty and Christ is full. They are a sub layer of authority where Christ is a full authority and he is above all of it. And all of it, whatever you think it is, it's all subject to Jesus. Now, I will say that I think yoga is okay. <laughs> I, I personally have done and do sometimes right. do yoga. Um, there are philosophies behind it that I don't always agree with. And sometimes those have nothing to do with the exercises you're doing. Right. And sometimes they do, right? And somewhere in there, there's an opportunity to say, whatever there is, it's subject to Jesus Christ. Thoughts on that? We sometimes, I think, hear uh, some touch of elemental principles of this world in the way that people talk about um, what the universe has done or is giving or is doing. Um, that's a, a way of talking about um, some part of the created world as personified, as doing something, right? Um, all of that subject to Jesus. That was the example that came to mind for me. I don't know if you all have examples. So in verse nine, we have the reiteration of the big theological point, right? The, the full divinity of Jesus. Um, and it's given in both a theological, like you should know this about Jesus, but also a practical context, right? You don't need these other um, elements that are made into deities because Jesus is the fullest. He is head over all of them. And, um, you get to be full, verse 10. Why? How are we made complete? In Christ. Yeah, that fullness in Christ, the completion in Christ. You don't need any of these philosophies to complete you. You can be complete in Christ. And so for a young church, that is trying to make their way in a confusing world. Well, sometimes that's us, right? 
Sometimes the world is confusing and philosophies are competing. You know, Paul's encouragement for them is keep Jesus at the center. He is everything that you need. His, he will make you full and complete. I also think about false. This is, is dicey, obviously, and we've all heard about it, but false teachings of scripture, you know, like you think of TV evangelists or certain, I'm not naming any names, mega church leaders that maybe would distort and have you them in the name of worshiping God. Uh, and so there's a really fine, fine line to toe there. Yeah. I think those are both good examples and they probably apply to the next section as well, um, where, yeah, sometimes um, even in our church settings, our teaching of scripture, maybe those need question too, is Christ really at the center? And, um, you know, we ourselves can get ideas in our head that we then need to subject to scripture and say, am I, am I really... Am I really putting um, the truth of Jesus at the very center? It's, it's, and it's challenging. And yeah, I think to get, uh, you know, the, that prosperity gospel idea, um, I don't think is biblical. And so that is one way, one example we could look at. Yeah. Well, looking at the next section, I mentioned it might um, apply to the next section as well, because we're going to get into um, a version of what they might be drawn into that is religious. You know, they could be drawn astray, drawn, drawn astray with religious sounding ideas. Okay, so we're getting into 11 through 15. He says, um, in him, you also were what? Circumcised circumcised with circumcision not done done by hands yeah or or done by men it, it's a it's a not human not a human so there's this idea of circumcised but not um of the flesh not but spiritually right so circumcision in jewish heritage was you know you, you the physical circumcision the removal of the foreskin of baby boys and it was a covenantal sign it was a mark given to the israelites that they weren't going to make their own legacy by human means by um just you know fathering children according to their own will but God was going to make them a legacy and it was going to be defined by being God's people in God's way. And the thing in the ancient world is that like we're familiar with circumcision and lots of people do it, whether they're Jewish or not. Some do, some don't, varies. Yet mm -hmm. in the ancient world, it was only Jews. And it was considered very strange. And this was a time when baths were public and sporting events were done in the nude. And so this is a sign that showed um, what we would consider something that like you might never see uh, was sometimes public. And so we know from the rest of the New Testament that there were Jews who believed in Jesus and said, you're Gentile, you want to join the family of God's people, you need the sign to be part of the covenant people of God. You need to be circumcised, just like people had always needed to be circumcised to join the Jews. They're saying, if you're going to do that as a Christian, you need to be circumcised to be a Jew who believes in Jesus, what we would call a Christian, but they were, I mean, Paul is literally saying this is what Judaism is. This is the, the fullness of Judaism is believing in Christ. And so they said, well, it's still Judaism. Come get circumcised. Now, Paul is, it, this happens um, through many of his letters that he says that is not necessary. That's not what we do. Circumcision would have been a significant barrier in the ancient world, just like it would be today 
if you weren't circumcised as a baby, you know, you wouldn't want to undergo it. Um, but Paul says, you already did it, even though they didn't do it physically, right? You already did it because you did it spiritually. And he calls it putting off the body of flesh. Um, this is another little passage where our, our translators have tried to help us out by not giving us the literal version. The NIV says what? Putting off the... This would be in verse 11. Putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Okay. Putting off the body of flesh or putting off the sinful nature is how it's often translated. Putting off the sinful nature. Well, there's nothing in there that has the word sinful and nature. It's the word body of flesh. And flesh is often used to indicate um, sinful nature in, in Paul's writings especially. And so it may mean exactly that, but it's not exactly what it says, right? It's body of flesh. And this may be a parallelism. Right, you you put off the body of flesh or the sinful when you put on the body of Christ. So the body of flesh and the body of Christ are put in parallel, and that is your circumcision. He calls it a circumcision done by Christ. And the point his point he's making here is that it's already done. Now even in the Hebrew scriptures, there was already a tradition of spiritual circumcision. So listen to Deuteronomy 36. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul so that you may live. So we see here that the circumcision of the heart is equated with love for God and a life lived in God. And then um, Jeremiah 4.4, 4, circumcise yourself to the Lord, remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Jeremiah talks at length about how they are abusing the poor, abusing the widow and orphan, how all the the um, merchants were cheating their customers that, you know, he talks about um, basically abuse of power and how his wrath was coming on them for their abuse of power. The opposite of that is circumcise your heart. So even in the Old Testament, we have both the positive equated with love for God and the negative putting off the evil deeds um, of abuse of others. And so Paul is not saying something that's foreign even to Judaism. Now they would have expected to have physical and spiritual circumcision um, as, you know, the idea of dedicating yourself to and putting your trust in the Lord. But Paul says, you've done it. And how have you done it? What does he equate to spiritual circumcision in verse 12? Baptism. Baptism. Yeah, yeah. He talks about baptism and how it symbolizes dying with Jesus and rising to resurrected life. And so, you know, um, if we, many Protestant groups wouldn't be very familiar with that, with baptism in the early church, this group will be, but it's, you know, it's that idea of immersion. Immersion is what makes this metaphor make sense, right? You go down it, into the water like going down into the grave coming up out of the water is like rising with jesus and so paul goes on to another description of salvation in verse 13 he says you you've you've been you've bad been baptized um buried with him in baptism raised with him through life because you were verse 13 what Uncircumcised of your sinful nature. 
Okay. You, um, and, and then what, do you have anything else in that one? Uncircumcised in your sinful nature. What's the first part of that? Dead in your well, Dead in your Right. This is an, ex the, he, this is an extreme description, right? That you were dead. He says you were all the way already dead being uncircumcised, not the people of God, Gentiles, right? But also in sin, dead. And so forgiveness, he's equating with being made alive. Life-giving forgiveness is what you're receiving. And we know that, you know, baptism itself does not do these things, but God does them for us in this um, in this ritual of baptism, he says in verse 14 that there was a certificate of debt um, canceled. I noticed Aaron's translation had that, uh, something like it, certificate of debt. Um, the NIV has the written code, and it makes it sound like it's like an entire law code. But, and I think Paul is referring to the law. But the, it's literally an IOU. It's a certificate that says that you are in debt is the, the words that he uses there. And it's the idea of the law as pointing, because it exists, we can see that we fall short of it. We can see that we've broken it. Um, but it, it's the same way that in other books he talks, uh, Paul talks about the law being a ministry of death or a ministry that brings condemnation. So that the law is like um, something that's opposed to us because it, it causes us to recognize how we um, have fallen short of it. And Paul says it has been what? He took it away, nailing it. The cross. The cross. Yeah, yeah. So both the law and the sin or the debt that we recognize against the law has been nailed to the cross. All of this is specific to whom? What, what group is Paul targeting with this line of logic? The Jews. Yeah, this would be the Jews, right? No Gentiles are out there arguing that they need to be circumcised or that um, they need to follow the law. And so when Paul is speaking this way, we get a clue that the, the problem that he's trying to address in Colossae and the people he's trying to address, some of them were Jews who were false teachers. And um, he is hitting that. But I think he also hits sort of the, the Gentile side next because he says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, right? So whatever those elemental principles, spirits, uh, rulers are, um, in whatever philosophy you're coming at, Jesus has been victorious over them. He even disarmed them. You know, you, you're victorious over someone, then you take away their weapons. Um, and it says what? What else did he do? Verse 15. He made a spectacle of them. Mm -hmm. Triumphing yeah. over them at the, by the cross. Yeah. So the, the uh, metaphor here, the, the public spectacle of triumph, is it's referring to the Roman tradition of a victorious general leading a parade back into the city with their captives in the train of the parade um, and pointing out, look, I, I can prove that I have defeated these powers, rulers, authorities, here they are, they're captive in the train. And so he's, he's taken, you know, we've, we've kind of come full circle with this idea. Don't be taken captive. Jesus has already taken captive whatever powers we think are running the universe. Jesus has made a public display 
of having been victorious over them. And that's all by the cross. So the very event that seemed to be a great defeat of Jesus, his ministry, his, his uh, mission was his victory by which he took away the weapons of sin and death. He took away the weapons of whatever minor deities or universe or principles that we think are running the place. They're all subject to Jesus. I have a question. Well, oh, go ahead. Everybody. This might make us run. I'm assuming Jesus himself was not circumcised because they were in the middle of nowhere in a barn with just animal witnesses and no holy man to do it. And it's supposed to be done on the eighth day. Right. And so is there is there some symbolism there between the creation story taking less than eight days and then man adding circumcision on a day longer than or two days? Long, he addresses Sunday. He didn't do anything on the rest of the day man adding on circumcision on the eighth day specifically is there a tie to that because unless i missed something i don't think jesus was circumcised right so he yes he would have been he was presented at the temple on the eighth day oh, okay okay we get those stories of simeon and anna at the temple and so um and his parents were too poor to have the the larger sacrifice and so they brought the doves wow. so he was the, circumcised and baptized yes yeah circumcised as a, a baby on the eighth day and this was god's instruction that yeah. it be on the eighth day and i i don't i think you could be on to something with the symbolism like seven days and then on the eighth you know but this it was god's instruction i don't think we would say man added that on and yet i think that might bear some meditating on if there's some symbolism there between the eighth day and the seventh day yeah that's a very interesting idea so you know god had instructed the circumcision and it was done for all of the babies and then we see jesus being baptized by john john the baptist um as as another beginning right as another birth in a way of his ministry and the spirit descends as a dove and jesus proclaims this is my son whom i love listen to him did i say jesus god the father proclaims this is my son whom I love listen to him and so we get we get both of those in the life of Jesus I guess he wouldn't have fulfilled the prophecy yet because he hadn't lived his life and been crucified so he would have been following the old laws that makes sense yeah, yeah and I think even you know um, Jews would continue to be circumcised during this period as their um heritage and and it, that would continue for a time um, but the idea was that you didn't, a Gentile didn't need to be circumcised to be brought in, you know, and so we could think maybe of ways that, um, we expect people to make, uh, cultural changes into something that we're used to, but isn't actually part of being in Jesus, right? So the, the, we could we could definitely find parallels in that because we have ways that we're used to doing things. You know, and when we see missionaries in other countries and the ways that their, um, their Christian communities operate, it's often surprising and we go, oh, well, I guess you could do it that way. That's not how we do it, but I guess maybe there's nothing wrong with that. So, you know, definitely that, like, are we asking people to become us or asking people to become like Jesus? So, you know, great, great questions. Well, thank you everyone for a great discussion tonight. Um, the I have found that this specific lesson made me just, you know, just really think I need to think about what elements in 
our culture, in my life, in the world around us, sound spiritual and plausible, even in the church, but don't have Jesus as the center of everything. So that's something I am thinking about, that idea that I can only be my full self. And we as a community, because that you is plural in there, can only be our full selves, only be full, complete or full in Jesus, because he is the one with the power and the fullness and the life. So thank you for a good discussion. We'll be back next week doing Colossians 2, 16 through 3, 4. So we'll finish the chapter and go just, just a little bit into chapter 3. Other comments before we go to prayer time? Thanks, y'all.